Good. All right. Yes, hey, welcome, guys. I uh, appreciate you uh, taking some time. I know we're in uh, some crazy times right now and, uh, you know, definitely unprecedented in our lifetime. So, uh, we, uh, you know, I thought this was a pretty cool deal that uh, Coach G's put together, and uh, I appreciate you, uh, you, you inviting me. Uh, Coach G to do it. Uh, on behalf of uh, Coach Satterfield, um, you know, I'm here to uh, represent Louisville and, and uh, you know, share some things that, that have worked for us in the past and what we do in the in the kicking game. I think Coach Satterfield is, I mean, he is phenomenal. I think he's the best in the country. So if you, uh, if you ever find your way over here uh, in our area, you know, certainly come by and see us once all this stuff kind of calms down and, uh, and things get back to normal. But um, but anyway, I'm honored to be here. Um, I had told Coach G that basically, uh, you know, what I've found as far as a clinic setting, what I get the most out of is um, being able to interact and ask questions and, and um, just kind of kick around ideas. And uh, so I've got, uh, you know, I, I told him we'll take kind of the first half and talk about uh, the coverage game, uh, kickoff coverage and punt, punt protection, punt coverage. Um, and then uh, from there, uh, we can talk, you know, the last half about the return game, punt return and kickoff return. Um, I will tell you that, you know, essentially what I'd like to talk about and present is more technique driven, uh, less scheme. Um, and to be, to be blunt, uh, not really going to share a whole lot about what we do scheme wise at Louisville, uh, more so about what we do technique wise and what I believe technique wise um, that works. Um, and it's worked for at, at all levels. I was a high school coach um, in the state of Florida for a few years. I was, uh, my, my father was a uh, high school coach, longtime high school coach in North Carolina for about 45 years. Um, so, you know, I've seen where things, uh, you know, things don't always work. You know, we don't always emulate what the pros do. And, and um, you know, in high school when I was young, I, I kind of was like, well, we'll do it just like, uh, you know, North Carolina's doing it or, just like Florida's doing it or whoever, and, and that doesn't always translate. So uh, if you do have specific questions to um, what will work better on the, um, uh, what will work better on the, uh, uh, the high school level or the college level or whatnot, feel free to, uh, to share those as well. Um, so I guess what we'll do here, Coach, I think that uh, what we can uh, start with, there's a, there was a, somebody just, uh, popped in there on you, Coach G. Yeah, I'll, I'll handle yeah, that. Coach. I didn't invite. I didn't invite her. I don't know if you did, but I <laughs> no, I'll handle that, Coach. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, so we got. Uh, let's see here. I'm gonna try to share this screen. If I can make this thing, if I can figure this out. Uh, let's see. There it is. So we'll start with uh, some kickoff coverage principles here. And uh, this was, I can't remember who, who showed this to me the first time, um, but it's been several years ago. But I think this kind of makes sense as you're, as you're presenting this to your players of what kickoff coverage, what we're trying to, um, uh, trying to get accomplished. And so basically what, what this uh, gentleman showed me was, is that, all right, you take – you know, a lot of your kickoff coverage guys are going to be defensive guys. And, and so you take, um, you take your defensive line out of it. So take those D linemen out of it and just put your second level players and your third level players uh, on the field. And uh, from there, you know, you look at like if you were a 4-3 defense and you were just going to play tall sweep, just old school uh, formation tall sweep. And so as you label players, you see you got two corners, two safeties, uh, two outside backers, and a mic backer. He's like, all right, so if you were going to go play tall sweep to either side, your mic, you know, your mic linebacker. <laughs> Coach, this is a uh... – I got you. So what's the deal? So is that – does everybody see that? No, uh, if if they're not focused on the uh, on the active speaker, but that's why I just have to remove people as they go, and and uh, you know we'll roll from there. But I, you know, I get everyone's email, so um, yeah. So I know. I got you. Doing what. Yes. All right, all good, um, all good, man. Uh, so anyway, uh, you got 
the uh, so your Mike linebacker is like your five, you know, like we would call our five players. You know, or they're our ball players. They're playing inside out. Um, no contain responsibility. They're running sideline to sideline, and that's what you're trying to get. Typically, to depend on you know wherever we line guys up, it could be our fives in a base in a base coverage scheme. It could be your threes, your fours, whatever. But those guys are turned loose to go make the play, and and really just letting those guys run and play. Uh, your Sam and your Will, you know, would be an alley player, you know, running the alley, uh, playing inside out, no contain responsibility. Uh, the only difference in, in the coverage aspect with the fours and the fives would be that the fours are trying to maintain some spacing to the fives. They're trying to play off the fives. So, you know, we're not letting the fours be as free as the fives just because uh, you want to make sure the guys aren't stacking each other and you're not leaving, leaving uh, you know, too wide a space open on the field. Um, your threes are uh, like your safeties in the tall sweep. You're the force player. Uh, what we'll tell we'll tell those threes, and again, this is off of base deal. You can make them any, you know, you can line up these guys wherever you want to. But uh, but like your threes would be force players, keeping the ball inside and in front. Um, you know, we would leverage what we would do there with those guys with the force players is tell them they're going to leverage the outside shoulder of the ball carrier. You're not absolute contain, but we'd love for you to turn it back inside to your help is what we would like to do with those guys in that position. And then your, your, um, your corners there would be like your, your ones and your twos. Those are your absolute contained guys and the guys that are going to fit and fold off of those contained players. So those would be like your ones and your twos in a base uh, coverage scheme. And so, um, so as we're – through the years, I felt like particularly uh, at the high school level, um, this was very helpful in trying to explain what we're trying to get accomplished uh, with kickoff coverage. It all came about because uh, we had a guy that was presenting one time, and he had all these things labeled the same way, like like the fives were ball players, the fours were alley players, threes were fours, ones and twos contained in uh, safeties. But unless you're a defensive player or you're really a, a – a guy that's really locked into defensive terminology, which you know, a lot of all our guys are, I thought this was an easy way to present and to start, you know, kind of. So, so through the years, um, you know, I've used this to kind of start the season or start your off season to try to explain to guys, this is how we're trying to get lined up. This is, this is not lined up. I'm sorry. This is how we're trying to cover and where, you know, so where these principles come from when we tell you that you're an alley player, a ball player, force player, contain, or you're a safety. Okay, so I always thought that was kind of helpful to um, uh, to get it started. The uh, the other thing that um, that you know we talk about a bunch, and if I can find it, that's not the one. Just bear with me, guys. I'm not the most technological uh, savvy guy out there. Let's see here. Coach G, can you see that? Is that screen shared there? Uh, you got the, the Playmaker app up? No, this is from uh, – this is a uh, PowerPoint from the USF on it. You may just have to uh, just un unshare this screen and then share that one or, okay. or switch in between. I got gotcha. you. Yes, sir. Stop share. How about now? Yeah, uh, yep, kickoff coverage. Okay. Pat, yes, sir. Yeah. So this was, uh, we used this uh, a few years ago uh, when I was a coach in the South Florida, but just to show you how we kind of broke things up. So we tried to get um, a coach coaching two positions at a time. Felt like that that was a good way to um, uh, to break it up and give you a manageable group um, as far as you know who, who was coaching who and and whatnot. So that's how we did it. Um, I'm gonna go through all this. We do one thing that we do uh, spend a lot of time on still is teaching the rules of the game. You know, I think that's where you know that's where kind of the blooper reels start, right? Is like guys get out there and don't qu quite understand the rules, and so we spend a lot of time in preseason and 
in the spring trying to teach guys, you know, how it, how it all works. Um, so different kinds of kicks that, that we've used in the past, obviously you're kicking it deep, squib kicks, sky kicks, onside kicks, um, kickoff after a safety, you know, all those things that we all work situation-wise. Um, but, you know, I'll call your attention to the kickoff coverage techniques, and this is kind of where, you know, our focus goes a lot of time in the kickoff coverage is, is the ball in phase or out of phase. And if the ball is, is more than 15 yards from us, then we're going to avoid – uh, those blockers uh, the best way that we can based on um, what the what the scheme is what the you know what we're seeing as far as the the return coming at us and so we're trying to make really good decisions trying to identify if we can if they'll give us butt side which I'm sure you guys have all you know coached and talked about but you know if they're giving you wherever their butt side is they're trying to take you or trying to keep you away from that side so if you can avoid to that side that's going to put you at the point of attack um, we teach speed and stack and backdoor and stack. Um, the backdoor and stack is more of the avoiding butt side. The speed and stack is you're not going butt side, but there's enough distance between you and the blocker to where you can get back on top of him and make sure that, uh, that you stack him and can get in position to make a play. The oftentimes, as you guys know, you know, kids are, if you were to just throw a bunch of guys out there covering kicks and trying to defeat blocks, they're going to speed and stack probably 95% of the time because it just feels natural. They're giving them, you know, that blocker's giving them that, uh, uh, that avoid area. Um, so that's where you're really trying to, to make sure they make a good decision. And if they do decide to speed and stack, then they can win and get on top and, uh, and be able to stack the, uh, the blocker. If, um, you know, what we don't want to do is run beside the blocker. You know, on kickoff coverage, it's really easy to be blocked in phase within 15 yards and the guy really just be in your way, not even – nothing devastating, nothing that's really um, that difficult to do. You just kind of be in your way and not allow you to get to, to the ball carrier. Uh, so the speed and stack is where, you know, they're going to want to do. That's what they – that's what your players generally want to do. But a lot of times can get them in trouble and get them, uh, you know, out of position to make a play. The backdoor and stack takes more work. Uh, takes more um, reps to uh, to get them to to see that uh, to to see what um, you know uh, how to make the right decision and then to stack right away and get on top. The um, one thing that we do we we try to really give our guys uh, guidelines on how we want you to play the kick and play the block, but then also how to get yourself out of trouble. And so one of the things that we coach big time is if you avoid the wrong way. You know, you, you think it was a, a butt side to your left, so you go left, but really they were setting you up to go left. If you avoid the wrong way, then we always talk about pivoting and getting flat. Uh, we never want to run past the ball carrier. Um, and so we try to give these guys tools to win and then tools to correct within the play and, uh, and rep those as much as we can. Um, so that would be how we our technique in the fly zone when the ball's not in phase. When the ball is in phase, um, what we want to do when the ball's in phase is we want to run through blockers, okay? And uh, we will teach a two-gap technique. Um, but, again, this is something that, as far as the two-gap technique, that is something that um, you have to spend quite a bit of time on. And really the main reason is because you're trying to squeeze the air out between the ball carrier and the blocker. So I'm trying to take that blocker. I'm trying to deliver him to the lap of the uh, of the returner. And if I can do that, then I'm going to make that returner. Uh, I'm going to bounce him and make him run side to side, so we can rally to the ball. The problem with the two gap, in my experience, is if you're not long striding, running through the blocker, which a lot of a lot of guys won't do, just 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 because of uh, instinct they'll kind of stop and kind of peek and look around and peek and try to find the, the ball carrier. That's where the two gap is not as effective because now we're not squeezing any air out of it. We're, we're you know, on, on the, when we start talking about the return game, what we're trying to get in the return game, what we've always tried to get is a clean, uh, clean picture for the returner. We want to get as much clean air to where he can make a good decision as possible. So if you're not two-gapping, 
with any force and moving guys back and squeezing the air out of it, then really all you're doing is just occupying that blocker and, and allowing that returner to make a quick decision and, and be able to run by you. So uh, I think the two gap technique's excellent when, when it's done correctly. I think it can get you in trouble uh, when you're not uh, striking on the rise, you're not hitting on the rise, uh, if that makes sense. So those are the, um, those are techniques that we teach and we've taught for years and we'll continue as some huddle stuff. We, we do like to huddle. I think, you, you know, when you huddle, you make them defend the huddle. And I think there's some advantages to that. Um, this is kind of, this is in general, like a, a uh, deep kick. You know, typically your speed and read zone is your first 20 yards or so. Um, when you're trying to figure out what their scheme looks like. Uh, your fly zone is when you're going to start, uh, you know, taking on blockers. Now, I will tell you that as time has gone, uh, I've seen more teams set their blocks really deep and set their blocks more into the strike zone area. And obviously, these yard lines, this, this is in general because it all depends on the kick as well. Um, I was talking with uh, Greg Nord, uh, who has coached, coached at Louisville for a long time and uh, most recently coached at the University of Florida. He's a longtime special teams guy that, that I used to visit with up here a bunch. And he and I were talking uh, last week. and and he kind of put it in a way, and I guess I'd kind of looked at it this way, but never really in specific terms. But, you know, when you're trying to figure out if you're covering a kick well, if you're tackling the ball halfway, if they get half of, of where your defender is and where they catch the ball, for example, if they catch it on the, on the goal line and you're at the 30, if you tackle that guy by the 15, then you've got good coverage. And you say, well, coach, that's pretty simple. Yeah, I can figure that out. We just tackled inside the 20. Well, that's true, but I know a lot of times you don't get the kick you want, you know, you, you, and a lot of times as coaches, we look at it as, well, we kick the ball to the eight yard line and the guy gets it out, you know, he gets it out to whatever, the 27 yard line. And we're like, you know, well, what is that? Uh, say 23 yard line, he gets it out there and we're like, man, we got to do better than that. Well, I mean, in all actuality, it's pretty good coverage. And, and so, that's a pretty good – I think I thought it was a good perspective for me to hear uh, from him. Um, and it kind of, you know, makes me think a little bit about, you know, where – what you're asking your players to do and, and then what kind of feedback you're giving back to them. Um, one thing that we got away from uh, years ago was if the kicker kicked it in the wrong spot, uh, we would make that point. We'd say, hey, you're supposed to kick it you know, deep left, and we want it over there by the numbers, and then the guy kicks it, you know, he kicks it outside the hash. And then there were times early in my career where we would just go nuts on the kicker. And we'd do it in the in a in a team setting with the with the kickoff coverage team in there. And what I found over the years was was that well really what we're doing is when those guys covering the kick, we're kind of giving them a built-in excuse to where because they know by how we reacted before, he kicks in the wrong spot. Well, then, you know, coach is going to blame the kicker. You know, if I screw it up, it's really not that big a deal. And so that's one thing we kind of changed a while back is we tell our guys, it doesn't matter where he kicks it, we're going to cover it effectively. And, and then from there, uh, now we will tell the kicker, hey, we need it in this spot. And if he doesn't, then we certainly let him know that. But we kind of changed how we, how we uh, convey that message uh, over the years. And, I, and that's made our coverage better. It's made guys, you know, cover as hard as they could every time and not not let up when they see the ball go where it's not supposed to go. Um, let's see here. Uh, just different types of returns. You know, we talked to them. Now, the wedge, is illegal now? I don't know. Um, is, what's going on in high school with the wedges? I'm curious about that. Is that has that been a change or is it still the same? I mean, <clears throat> we work, like, like for us, we, we work um, – Kind of like a four man wall, but we really can't kind of wedge it up like like real. It's kind of is it against the rules now if you guys come together in a wedge? Uh, I believe I believe uh, well I guess it depends where state you're at. Coach one coach said it, they're they're still allowed for them. Yeah, except in Texas. Well, they just changed the rule in college, and 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 but honestly, I mean, we saw teams this year it. didn't really it change. On the, seems yeah. like it depends on the state. Depends on where you are. Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, we saw teams that didn't really change, just kind of did what they always have done. And, and um, 
and it really didn't get called. I think it moves really fast for the officials. I think it's something they really can't see very well. Um, so, but anyway, we, we talk about, you know, the different types of returns you're going to see, the wedges, the double teams, if you're going to get trapped, crossers coming across the field, um, and obviously any deceptive stuff. And then just what areas that, that, that teams are trying to return the ball. Um, you know, it's typically going to be a sideline alley or, or down the middle return. Um, and Justin, you can stop me anytime. If, uh, yeah, a couple of questions just came in, actually. Uh, okay. Is it recommended to make crossings in kickoff? Uh, crossings. What do you mean? Coach, can you just expand on that? Coach Cordova, just expand on that a little bit. Um, while he's doing that, another question is, who works directly with the kickers and punters at practice? Do they have kicking experience? If not, why do colleges not invest in guys that have kicking experience? From it sounds like a kicking coach. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Hey, he put that at the end. <laughs> Probably for hire, too. Uh, <laughs> hey, um, well, I was a long snapper in college, and and I've been – I kind of started my I – mean, I can just tell you how, how I do it. We I started my career teaching long snap, and I was around a bunch of kickers and and uh, punters working camps in, 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 uh, uh, in the summertime when I was in college. So, uh, so we coach them ourselves. Uh, we, you know, we reach out to, uh, we reach out to all the, the guys that, uh, you know, the kicking coaches out there, and we get their, their input. And typically guys are working with, um, um, you know, with, with everybody pretty much has a, a coach nowadays. And, and so we, we're certainly open to talking to those guys. We're good, Coach. Okay. What, did you get any answers on that crossing deal? He hasn't expanded on it yet, Coach. All right, cool. All right. Um, let's see here. This is just – all this is here is uh, is just kind of explaining a little more in detail what we're asking those guys to do. Kind of that first – Deal started with with the you know the ball players or inside out players no contain responsibility. Uh, the alley players are playing inside out no contain. Um, they're playing the inside number of the ball carrier. Okay, and then they're they're trying to space off of uh, you know, they're trying to space off of the uh, force players um, keeping the ball on the outside shoulder of the ball carrier, turning the ball back inside, and then. Um, you know, your, your contained players. Now, I can tell you with the twos, twos are setting the edge. You know, those guys are setting the edge of the coverage, keeping the outside arm and leg free. Um, and if you're on the back side, you got the 21 man rule. So you're seeing all 21 guys on the field. And then the ones are playing off of them, uh, playing off of the twos. Uh, if, the, if the two does his job, then the one's going to fold into the scheme. If the two doesn't do his job, then the one gets vertical right now and, and uh, becomes a contained player. So. So, Coach, he was saying, uh, I guess, just having two players cross on kickoff. Yeah, um, I think that um, – let's see here. Yeah, I think that it's – certainly it's good to do uh, that type of stuff. You know, what – I think the two questions you got to ask yourself is what are you gaining versus what they're going to do? And then also are you having to teach another technique uh, to two different guys on your team? And, you know, there's different ways to do it. You can, you can group, you know, like your – you can take, like, your, your six guys that are inside of your scheme and, and you can um, have them all kind of play the same technique so you can always move them around. Or you can, uh, you can change alignments. You know, the, the change alignment thing works and it's good. Um, but, you know, obviously with film study, you know, guys – it's pretty easy to figure out where they're going to end up. If you're asking the, you know, one guy to end up in the same spot every single time, then it's pretty, pretty obvious to figure out what they're going to do. But, you know, it's just like anything else. It's like offensive defense. I mean, you know, you still got to, you know, you still got to stop it. You still got to block them. So, you know, it's certainly, you know, I think it's definitely helpful. It just all depends on the situation. We're good, coach. All right. Uh, anything else that you got on kickoff coverage? Guys, if anybody has any questions, just hit the chat box <clears throat> in regards to the kickoff coverage. Are we playing with fire by doing that, uh, Coach G? No, the, the questions are just coming to me. Uh, so, you know. I got you. <laughs>
had to boot a handful of them out though. So yeah, I got you. Um, all right. So you want? So I don't know how how long we got. You want to go uh, for how long? I mean, it's up to you, coach. The next session doesn't start till three thirty, so you have time to do your thing. You want to? Uh, you want to get into some punt stuff? Or yeah, we can do that. Do that? Just, yeah, let's All get right. punt stuff. All right, let's do that. Let me uh, see if I can get some of that pulled up here. Do, do, do. All right. Did that come up on the uh, – that's not shared, is it? No. How's that right there? Is that shared? Uh, yes, sir. All right. Um, well, I'm going to – what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, shield punt. And, and basically, we ran – we ran several several punt schemes in the past. Um, I'm trying to figure it out. So I think that I think the shield punt is the most versatile punt in terms of being to run it at at any level. I think that um, it's it's easy to teach and um, easy to count. Uh, probably fits personnel better than uh, than most uh, schemes. Um, so I'll just kind of talk through that a little bit and then we'll talk through some, some technique stuff. This is, this will be a little bit more scheme than technique, but, but, um, essentially really what it comes down to is can your long snapper protect? And if your long snapper cannot protect, then shield punt is the way to go. If your long snapper can protect, then you can, you can include him in protection. And what that's going to allow you to do is get more guys out in coverage. Um, so you know that's really where it starts um, when you when you're talking about punting the ball. The shield punt uh, snapper. This is a guy that can't protect, so he's got no protection responsibilities. Um, they're going to have to adjust to us. We can do a little bit formationally, uh, not as much as you probably like to, but but uh, but you can do a little bit. Um, you do get your coverage players, and they can get into coverage faster, depending on your your uh, uh, your splits. You know that can help you. And then if you can rugby, which, you know, if you can add the rugby element to it, then it, it becomes a, a scheme that's really hard to, uh, um, to defend. And then you do have, you know, several fake possibilities out of a uh, shield punt. Your off time's got to be good because you're going to turn loose. You know, you don't have enough. When your center's not in protection, you're turning loose to the backside, at least one guy off the backside. So your off time's got to be good. We shoot for 2.0 or better. Uh, your backside end has got a has got a really uh, tough uh, block. He's got a he's got to cut off that backside too, and uh, and get him uh, uh, get him out of the picture. You know, um, your shield players. You know, if you're going to a to a traditional shield where the center doesn't protect, then you're going to turn loose the guys on the inside, and your shield players uh, are going to have to be bigger guys. You know, and the bigger guy you use. Then the less reliable they are in coverage. Uh, so, you know, if you're using offensive linemen, uh, some defensive linemen, then those guys are going to be less reliable in coverage. So you got to be aware of that. And then, uh, you know, if you, if you are going to, uh, I do recommend that if, if you go to straight shield, that you are able to rugby punt. This is how we coached it up uh, back in the day. This is, uh, uh, we would have one guy on the left side, one guy on the right side, a guy coaching the shield, and then I would coach the center and the, uh, and the punter is how we did it uh, year, a few years ago. Um, so red and black for us then was a normal punt. Okay, so that was a that was a normal traditional punt. Silver was a rugby punt, and this was kind of you know, we we make these calls from the sideline, and um, and so the the regular punt would be you know from the 35, you know from coming out from the 35 down the field. Uh, we'd be thinking about rugby punting from the 25 in. She has the 35, 25. 25 in, and then we'd go to tight punt if we were minus three and back just to kind of just make sure we got it protected and can get it out uh, if we were backed up. Um, Kane and stuff, need to worry about that. This is what I was talking about alignment-wise. So, like, if uh, – let's say we're punting this ball to the right, which would make a red call. Then this this cat right here, this, this end, okay, 
we would tell him they go we go two yards here, two yards here, three yards here, and then we tell him to try to get one more. And then if he got one more, he could free release because a guy couldn't get there in time to go pressure the punt. Plus, he's eligible, which certainly adds another another aspect to it. The left end on the other side, we would try to get him to three yards, but we would tell him he would have performance alignment um, because um, if we're punting that red call away from him, he's got to block the two to his side. So we try to get him to draw that two out, but a lot of times he won't because they're going to play the one with him because, again, he's eligible. But, um, but anyway, if we could, we'd like to get that split. If we can get three yards right there and get, a, get the two out here, then he could free release as well. Um, so that was kind of alignment-wise. That kind of helped us a little bit. These two-yard splits, uh, we try to make them as, as non-negotiable as possible because we want to widen the edge, particularly on the backside. Try to get eligible numbers in here if you can. But, again, if you're having to use uh, a lineman, that's going to be tough to do. And then, uh, and then you know, obviously we would – we would uh, – the punter would be lined up at 15 ready to punt the ball. Um, this is a whole lot of stuff that probably is not going to translate too well on the computer. But I can tell you at the top right here, you're basically going to teach two steps, and this is where you get into the blocking technique. Um, if, if the guy you're blocking, if he's within your body, then you're going to work a six-inch slide step. We call it a lead step. And you're going to destroy the charge, and then you're going to get out into coverage. Okay? So if he's within your body, you're going to do a lead step. If he's with outside, outside your body, you're going to bucket step. And that's a wide 40, 45 degrees drop step, okay? Uh, inside or outside based on the defender because it's, it's a man scheme for the, the guard tackle in the end. These guys are all blocking man. So you identify your man, where he's aligned, and that's going to tell you what to, you know, how you're using your, uh, you know, what steps you're going to use to, uh, to protect the punt. Um, you know, your backside end, the guy that's got the, the backside block, he's going to be bucket stepping a lot. And, and trying to, to work like heck to get his head across the defender and wash him down. Um, and then your shield, guys. So your shield, you can do it one of two ways. You can, you can man it. You know, you're gonna, you, they're going to know who is, uh, who's coming free. So you can assign them a man and you can man it. If you man it, you can, you can use smaller guys um, because they're going to be more aggressive. Or you can zone it. And you can use bigger guys. Uh, it just kind of is up to what you have and what you feel comfortable with. When you zone it, you're less um, you're less vulnerable to twisting and in any kind of games or working on your shield. Um, however, you're not as you know you're not going to have as heavy guys in there typically. When you zone it, um, I don't know. I kind of lost my train of thought there. I don't know if I said zone or man, but basically, if you're zoning it then you don't have to worry so much about twist. If you're manning it, you do have to worry about twist because it's really hard to pass those off. So you really got to just kind of commit to it and, and your opt time's got to be great, if that makes sense. Um, if, if, if that's unclear, just throw a question in there. We'll hit it again. Um, but here's your lead step, your bucket steps, your leads inside or outside based on the defender within your body. Bucket steps outside and you're going you're gonna to open and run, destroy the charge and go. Um, this is drawn up right here as a zone scheme with the shield guys. So how, how we had taught this was uh, we give them a landmark. I think we had a heels at seven. Um, and so the, the PP would come in, and we'd identify these four gaps. as a B gap outside, A gap to the left, A gap to the right, and a B gap to the right. And what we would do is we would tell these guys they got to get big in there, um, got to have some courage, you got you to pick the right guys. Um, but, for example, like the left shield, he's going to play that B gap with his left hand and left shoulder. He's going to give help to the PP inside with his right hand and right shoulder. The PP is going to play the left A gap with his left hand, left shoulder, the right A gap with his right hand, right shoulder. And then the, uh, the right shield is going to play the uh, – he's going to help the PP with his left hand, left shoulder, and then he's going to play the right B gap with his right hand, right shoulder. So, you know, when you're doing that um, – you know, that's why you need bigger guys. You know, you got to have some guys with some weight in there. Coach, you got a question here. Um, yep. How often do you switch from man to zone, and is it based on the opposing team? Uh, no, nah, we just pick one. We just pick one, you know, before the season, and that's what we do. Um, I think that you, there's so many reps involved that you just got to – how we did it, you know, one year would be a zone, one year would be a man, and it was it was all based on what we had on our team, you know, what, what our personnel, you know, fit, what we needed. You know, I like having the smaller guys 
if I if I had to choose, I'd I'd man it and I'd have smaller guys where I can get in coverage a little bit better. Um, but you know, sometimes it's not worth it. You know, maybe your maybe your punter doesn't have great hands. Maybe you can't get his op time down. Maybe you know you like to have bigger guys in there that zone it up and just keep that wall in front of them. So you know, it just all depends on what you have and what you think fits. There was a couple questions here, uh, coach, in regards to uh, kickoff. Yeah. Uh, where is it? Uh, going back, yeah, going back to the kickoff coverage. Does uh, do you teach running to landmarks or maintaining distance between players as they run down for coverage? We're more maintain distance, but we're um, but the landmark deal is great if you got a great kicker. So if you can, if you feel like you've got, you know, nine out of ten times he can kick it where you want it, then then the landmarks are great because you can tell the guy, hey, this is where you're working to. Um, the issue is, is that when you, in my opinion, the issue is when you start doing different things with your kick, then now, you know, now they get a new landmark, you haven't repped it as much, you're not as familiar with it, and then you're going to play slower. We, our number one deal in anything we're doing is we're trying to play fast. So whatever we can do to, to help these guys play fast is what we're going to do. And, and so we're more of a um, spacing team of, you know, maintaining good space. Um, you know, back in the day, it was a lot of, you know, you heard guys talk about stay in your lane, stay in your lane. Um, again, if you're teaching lanes all the way down the field, in my experience, uh, you're not going to play as fast. And if you're teaching more of, you know, try to maintain some spacing as you go and give guys a little bit more freedom to make decisions. And again, give them some ways to get back. If they make the wrong decision to get themselves right, you know, I think that allows you to play a little faster. Uh, and to follow up with that, because another coach asked if you had any tips on landmarking the field for your kicker. For your for the kicker? Yeah. Well, um, gosh, I mean, it, for example, like say we're kicking deep, say we're going to kick the ball deep left, and we're going to say, okay, uh, we here's what this would be how this is how we have evolved over the years. So it used to be we'd say, okay, we want this ball on the numbers. We want it. We want this thing as close to the goal line as you can get it. We want 4.0 hang or better, um, and we want it on the numbers. And if you were to chart those out of 10 kicks, you might get three of those if you have a an adequate kicker. You got an above average kicker, you got a good kicker, and then he can do those type of things. I think again, that's where you, you start asking guys to do things based off of what would be ideal, you know, instead of asking them to do things that they can do on a consistent basis. And so um, what I would do is is instead of trying to hone in on like say the numbers, I say, okay, let's get this ball left of the hash as close to the sideline as you can get it without without kicking it out of bounds. Um, and then chart where they're hitting the ball. And then take a look at, you know, now you're starting to get into their steps, um, the angle that they're, when they make contact with the ball, I'd film it so you can watch it. And, and to me, one of the, 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 some of the best feedback that we've ever got, we've ever given kickers and punters is when we have camp, uh, when we have camp anywhere we've been, we have iPads on the field. So we film those guys as they're being instructed and they watch it on the field so they can see it and then hopefully make some kind of correction or, or give them positive feedback. Hey, you're doing it well, keep doing this, but you can slow-mo it. You can show them exactly what you're talking about. You know, it's no different than if you're coaching any other position, what you're telling them on the field, a lot of times they don't understand until they see it on film. And fortunately, when you're dealing with specialists, a lot of times you're, you know, you're, on another field or you've got time to, to really give them some positive feedback. And, um, you know, and that can, uh, and, and I think that helps them a ton. And so now you start looking at the angle when they, when they kick the ball and look at their steps, uh, how they approach it, how we want to tweak it. You know, how do we get your hips going to where we want to, to land the football? You know, you can get into a lot of stuff then, you know, but the film part is, is key and, and listening to them, you know, I think that, a lot of times coaches, you know, particularly the kickers, like I was saying, they, a lot of them have their own personal coaches now. So, you know, I try to get, you know, what is it that makes you tick? And what are your coaching points? And then, and then I try to know those, um, commit them to memory 
So when they do struggle, then I can kind of talk to them in, in the same term they gave me and not make up what I, how I interpret it because, you know, you're just kind of you're slowing down the process. I don't know if, that's a, if that makes sense. But no, for sure. Um, another one here, Coach. How do you define successful kicks or coverage uh, in yards or, example, like explosive plays, touchbacks, fair catches? Well, we're, we're trying, you know, with now with the fair catch being in, in the kickoff game, then they can fair catch it, um, get it at the 25 anytime they want it. So if we're covering a kick, then we want to keep them from getting to the 25. Obviously, we'd love to get them inside the 20. I think that's really what we present to the guys is like, hey, we want to get this thing inside the 20. Um, but, you know, if, if we have a team that's going to return it, then we're trying to keep them inside of, of the, the line of where they'd get it if it were a touchback. Um, you know, obviously, from a, from a large-scale perspective, as you look at it through the season, and, you know, one thing we're looking at in the turn games, how many times can we get all the offense past the 50? And in the coverage game, we don't ever want to give it to them past the 50. So even if we play the kick, we play the return in a poor way and they break out on us, we still want to rally and get that thing corralled before it gets past the 50. You know, if you get – you start looking at percentages of when teams score, then, you know, that that field position battle um, is, you know, key to winning there at the points on the board. So we try to get our guys to understand that. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, most of your kickoff coverage team is going to be defensive guys anyway. So they have an invested interest in, in uh, you know, keep them you know, looking back as far as you can. No, for sure. And uh, <clears throat> one more here was just asking if, if you had any uh, kickoff coverage diagrams that you could uh, show or, or go over. Um, hold on one second. Hey, uh, I know my, we got a guy on our staff trying to get in on this meeting coach. Uh -huh. He said he's got, he got kicked out. Um, I don't know how you can, can you, I sent him the link. Yeah. Um, see if he can, if he can, uh, try to get in from a different device that usually works. Okay. Guy just got lost in the shuffle with something, but all right. His name's uh, Maslowski. He's our he's our quality control guy, and he's a okay. he's a great, uh, great football coach. Um, okay. Trying to find different. Device. Sorry, guys. I'm just trying. Okay. Uh, what was the question again? Uh, in regards to um, uh, kick kickoff coverage diagrams, if you had any that you could show or go over. Um. Yeah, let's see here. Let me see what I can figure out here. Anything before we move on to that? Is there anything else on punt? Anything else? In, anybody want any more on punt? Yeah, if anybody has uh, do, 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 do. any tips, drills, uh, tips and drills on developing a long snapper. Uh, try to find a guy. So if you so if you got a guy that uh, particularly if you got a scheme they don't have to protect, then um, then go find a guy that's played baseball. You know, just go out there before practice and watch guys throw. You know, and just watch them throw. It doesn't matter what position they play. If a guy can throw a spiral with some velocity, he can long snap a spiral with velocity. Um, it, and then from there, I mean, I it, and you can tell that I'll share my email uh, at the end of this deal. And um, I mean, I'll share it right now. It's Stu S T U at gocards.com. Um, so if if you want specific drills and stuff like that as far as development of, of specialists, then certainly reach out to me. And I'll be glad to help you. I won't charge you near what Rubio charges you. I won't charge you anything. <laughs> and then uh, another that was, question. That's for my that's for the kicking coach that's on here. What's his <laughs> name? Have him email me too. Uh, where was he again? Uh, coach Tillman. All right, Coach Tillman. Shoot me an email, Coach Tillman. Yeah. Um, so, uh, what else on punt? Anything else? Um, no, there was a, a, just another question on uh, uh, how you teach tackling for kickoff. Well, tackling for kickoff and punt. Uh, so, we teach exactly what our defense teaches. And, and that is something that um, became really big probably six, seven years ago. Um, maybe not that long ago. Anyway, uh, point being, I was on a, uh, on a team where um, our defensive guys 
were really frustrated because we weren't tackling well in space. And, and they were trying to, uh, you know, to come to balance, leverage the ball. Um, they, they really were coaching a lot of technique on tackling. And essentially they just said, you know, they threw it out the window and said, look, go take your shot. Go take your shot. We're going to rally to the ball. We're going to play really aggressive. Well, we didn't change what we were doing special teams wise. So we kept teaching uh, scale to the ball, lead with your inside foot, be ready to uh, uh, be ready to redirect, keep your hips open so you can't, you know, you don't cut yourself off, um, leverage the backside hip. I mean, all, you know, all the basic fundamental tackling deals. Well, the defense coordinator came to me one day and he's like, hey, have you ever thought about that? You're teaching them, we're basically teaching them two different ways to, to play defense, to play, to tackle. And he, and he made it, and it was a great point. And, and I said, yeah, I hadn't really thought about it, but, you know, we're going to teach what, what you know, they're, they're practicing defense a whole lot more than they are special teams. And so, so then from that point, um, so every year in the offseason, I'd get with the defense coordinator and we would just kind of look at different um, open field situations and I'd, and I'd just take notes and write down what they're, what they're teaching. Um, and then we would try to, to teach it the same way. Uh, in our coverage aspect, and and we got we got better, uh, we got better. It was definitely uh, definitely the way to go, in, in my opinion. Uh, if you don't like your punter, uh, if you don't like your punter's distance, uh, would you rugby punt? Um, yeah, I think you got to figure out just just however you can get it down the field, you know, however you can get the ball where you need it, and and if you can't do it, then then he's probably not your guy. And if you don't have anybody else, and Man, I've been there. I, I don't know. Uh, we had, I mean, there was a year we had a championship team. We had an outstanding team. And the only thing we couldn't do was punt the ball. And that was really, really frustrating in the offseason. And fortunately, we were able to to find a guy that could do it. But um, the rugby punt is a great tool if, uh, if you teach a guy to do it. You know, one thing I'll tell you that, that I figured out over the years is, is – a lot of your team is not going to volunteer to do certain things you need them to do. So if you'll, if you'll just kind of pay attention, like I, I would go out and pre-practice a lot of times when the guys are just out there kind of waiting for practice to start. And I just kind of watch and see and see who can throw the ball a little bit. You know, everybody loves to punt when it doesn't matter. You know, they're out there just punting with their buddies. And, and I'd kind of watch and see who could do certain things. I kind of look and say, all right, that we might be able to, you know, that guy might be able to help us here, might be able to help us there. And, and um, instead of the, you know, we've all been there when you get to the end of practice and you're like, you know, coach and the head coach is like, hey, you got something to say. And then and you say, hey, anybody, anybody can take punt or snap, you know, or catch, catch punts, stick around after, you know. And that's been, they've been practicing for two hours and they're ready to go home. And um, <clears throat> so I think that, that uh, I would just keep that in mind. It's still happening. I mean, it, I, we got the end of the season this year and, and some, one guy said to me one day, like, hey, you know, I can long snap. I'm like, well, how would I know that? I mean, I didn't, you know, you got to tell me, you know. And, and and so chances are a lot of times you've got it on your team. Uh, you just got to maybe get a little creative on how you figure out where those skill sets are. With that rugby punt, uh, how are you? How would you change the protection? Uh, the, the front side's got to hold up longer. So, like, if um, – um, Uh, let's see here. Uh, give me a second here. I'm trying to get to it. Give me one second, Coach. No worries. For some reason it's not letting me. I'm sure it's not. It's not the. It ain't the technology. It's me. Let's see here.
I don't know, for whatever reason, man, it's not letting me um, – every time I open it up, it's just going right to a uh, – what are you seeing on your screen? Oh, uh, just you. All right. How about now? Same thing? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Let's see if we can make this work here. Um, screen share. All right. What do you got now? Uh, rugby punt. All right. All right. So with this, uh, you still got it? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. All right. So with the rugby punt, so it's basically a right protection. Uh, this is assuming you got a right footed punter. Um, and so a couple things have to be adjusted. So now you're, you're right in, there's no free release. Now uh, he's got to protect because obviously the ball is being punted behind him. And then, um, so then your, your front side, your guard, your tackle, your end, they have to hold their block. They're blocking R1, R2, and R3. They got to hold their block for one full second um, because it's taking a little bit longer to get the ball out of his hands. Your shield guys are now going to work in unison. So the PP is going to insert into the shield and then start shuffling to the right. And they're now it's going to become a, um, a zone deal. Okay. So here's how we would teach it. We would say, all right, you're the right shield. All right, you've got from your nose to anything outside of you. So it could be one player, two player, three player, whatever, but you're going to block from your nose out. The PP's got from his nose to the nose of the right shield. The left shield's got from his nose to the nose of the PP. Anything left of the left shield's nose, anything left of him, okay. And then on the back side, if you see up there, the left end, left tackle, left guard, it says normal underneath them. They're blocking L4, L3, L2, and they got a normal deal. And, and so the protection changes that way. The right side's got to hold up a little bit longer. The shield's got to get moving. They're going to shuffle. So once the PP inserts, they're going to say, go, go, go. And now they're going to shuffle to their right, and they're thinking about those zone landmarks from nose to outside or nose to nose, depending on the position that they play. And, you know, what I was telling guys is, You've got whatever's in that gap. So if it's one guy, two guys, three guys, you knock the first one into the second one. And then the, the punter, when he goes to rugby, all right, then we want to kick it by the fourth step. And we want to we want to run flat, as flat as possible. The challenge with that is if you're teaching a guy rugby, when he goes flat and then get him to bring his hips through and hit the ball where you want it to go. Um, it's funny on these rugby punts, you know, what's great about them is they're unpredictable, and so it makes it hard to return them. But what's what's hard about it is they're unpredictable. And so when you're the cover team, so if you're protecting and covering, okay, then now we're going to get into some landmarks when we're covering that rugby punt um, because we're, we know where we want him to punt it, but sometimes it's more difficult for him to, do that, for him to execute it. And so our, our right end now um, is going to uh, split the difference between the numbers and the, and the sideline. Our right tackle is going to be on the numbers. Our right guard is going to split the difference between the hash and the numbers. And then you see how it goes all the way across with the center, the left, guard, uh, left tackle, and left end. Um, that left end is absolute contain. Um, if, if he punts it, and we're telling the punter, we want him to punt it off of the numbers and at the very least get it right at a hash. Um, if he punts to left for whatever reason, um, and we want him to yell left, 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 we want the, the shield to echo that. It all gets echoed down the line so guys know that the ball wasn't punted where they want him to be so they can adjust their coverage accordingly. Um, it takes some work and practice, but it's not that difficult once they get it. Uh, but that's how, that's how we would teach it.
Um, we want that ball out of his hands in the 2.5 to 2.7 range. Now, there's other teams that they'll tell the guy to run and hold on to as long as possible. Um, we just never got into that. We just felt like we want to make sure we got the ball. Uh, we've been able to block a few of those over the years uh, just because, of, you know, a lot of times people stop pressuring them, and then we would pressure that guy holding the ball, and then we'd get a block. And uh, So we just always felt like we want to make sure we got it out of his hands. Uh, <clears throat> do you have any uh, any go-to fakes that tend to work best in the shield? Um, I think that um, – it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you're lined up in. If you're looking to fake the ball, then you want to make it as close to what you do all the time. So, um, what I mean by that is, whatever formation you're in the most, you know, um, you'd like to have a good fake out of that. If you line up in a weird formation, then you'd like to, you know, have a fake out of that. Um, as far as the shield, I mean, you can. You can hide a guy in the shield. I mean, I've seen teams do that. I've seen teams uh, hide a guy at, like the at the end spot. I've seen guys, you know, break the shield and you know put a guy on, step a guy off, that type of stuff, and, and figure out a way to get to him. The, the um, you know, I don't really have a say a go-to fake. I think it all depends on who you're playing and you know how what you see they're giving you. You know, as you're watching film. Uh, there was something else. Oh, uh, da, 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 da. Uh, keys to teaching punt returners uh, and and any drills that you have. Um, well, we just we catch a bunch of punts. I mean, we we catch a, a bunch of them. Uh, you know, as many as we can get it in a day. Um, you know, we just we teach simple fundamentals. Keep your elbows tight. Look the ball all the way in. Follow it with your eyes all the way down. Um, you know, the, the punt returner is a guy that's that, that's fearless. That, you know, to me, it, it's a lot more into who you're asking to do it. You know, it, I think we've all been in the situation where we're like, man, this guy's our best athlete. He's dynamic with the ball in his hands. Man, it'd be awesome if we get him get him back there returning punts. Well, if he don't have the courage to stand in there, um, if he gets spooked by the by the coverage, he's not your guy. Um, the guy to me is the guy that's got courage, the guy that's going to look the ball in, um, doesn't panic. And even if he's just a guy that sticks his foot in the ground and gets you seven or eight yards, then that's perfect, man. Now you're, you know, you're getting to start a little bit further down the field. And um, I think that the guy, you know, you're talking returners in general, whether you're talking kickoff returners or you're talking punt returners, I want guys that can break tackles and, and I want guys that, uh, you know, can make a play with the ball in their hands and it starts with them fielding the ball. So if they're not, if they don't have, if they're not savvy enough to field it and get their momentum going down the field and make good decisions, then I'm going to go with the lesser guy uh, with the ball in his hands and more so with the guy that's not going to turn the ball over. Uh, how often are you bringing pressure on punt return versus setting up a return? Um, it just, it's just game to game. It just depends. Um, you know, there's really no answer as far as how many times you do it. I mean, I think that, you know, you're just looking for you're just looking for chinks in the armor. I mean, if they're if you feel like you can pressure it and great. If you feel like that it's gonna be difficult, then you know, then then don't. But, you know, with that same you know, I, I, you know, you can look and see what guys have tried to do against them and been successful and not. And you know, I don't really get you upset. Know, you know, a lot of it's got to do with feel too. I mean, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to pressure a punt when you got momentum in the game, and then you get a, you get a big penalty, you give them the ball back, and you giving away momentum, and you know, head coach is yelling at you, and you know, it's not, nobody wants that. So, I, I don't know. It's really not a set answer there. Uh, yeah. Uh... Coach wants to know, in your opinion, why do you think that the shield has never been adopt hasn't been adopted by uh, teams in the NFL? Uh, the rules are different. So, so in the NFL, you can only have two guys leave on the snap. Um, their uh, their rules don't don't allow for it. Uh, the other the other eight guys on, in the NFL have to wait for the ball to be punted. Uh, so there's really no advantage to to being in the shield. 
I mean, you could line up in it to get it protected, I guess. But there's, uh, you know, the whole the whole deal with the shield was to be able to get, you know, Coach Ayers at Wofford, he's the first guy I saw do it way back in the early 2000s. And, and he used to spread them all the way across the field. Um, and his guys were just open and run and getting coverage. And that's kind of where it all started. And, that, and it was really innovative and really changed the game. Um, but the whole idea was, you know, the shield part of it was just to, you know, get some big guys back there to, to protect the punt and then get like six guys in coverage. And the NFL just doesn't allow for that. And they're, they're the rules. Good, Coach. Cool. All right. Anything else? We're good? You want to move on? Uh, yes, sir. All right. Um, what do you want to do? You want to go uh, we'll go some return game? Yeah, let's do that. Got, uh, How much time we got? Ten minutes, Coach. Ten minutes. All right. Let's uh, tell you what. Let's go – let's talk kickoff return because, you know, I'll, I'll tell you quickly about uh, – before I get to um, – Kickoff return. I'll tell you quickly about about punt return. To me, punt return is so different now because of all the formations. So it's really you know punt return is almost its own deal. You know everybody kind of does it differently and how you get lined up and all that. So and it's kind of a that's a long discussion. So um, let's just go into some kickoff return stuff. And you know I, th I thought what would be good is I I'm just going to pull up. Uh, just a base return. So this, can you see this uh, middle R5 return? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. So like this return is a six man, this is a six man front with uh, how we'd identify this, we call it a six by three by two uh, scheme. And the, uh, so what you got here is you've got, you've got six single blocks up front you got a two-man wedge on the on the back end with the fullback in the right end. You got a left end that's going to pin the uh, the L five. Okay, not pin. I'd say push him out. And then you've got the off returner kind of helping with him. You really, I mean, this could very easily look like a double team, a double double return where you got a double team on both fives. But um, but the reason why it doesn't really matter. You could put any return up here. And I'll just tell you a couple things that I think are vital to, to being a good kickoff return team. Um, you know, number one is getting the um, the guys up front, they have to see the trajectory of the ball. And they've got to understand that, you know, obviously by alignment, they know who they have to block. But they've got to understand based on how that ball travels over their head, what path they need to get to to make their block. And that, to me, is probably the biggest coaching point of, of those frontline guys. And once they see when that ball's kicked and they know if they've, if they've got leverage and they're going to keep leverage or if they don't have leverage and they got to go get leverage, um, the path of that ball is going to determine, you know, where they need to be in terms of, of making their block successful. The, the second part is um, they have to sprint there. Uh, there's no you can't you can't let your mind tie up your feet. You can't play slow. You've got to sprint to uh, wherever your landmark is. So, so we'll give our guys a landmark on the field. So, like right here, the right guard, he's going to make his block at the 30, and we'll draw it that way. And then we'll tell the right tackle he's going to make his block at the 35. And the same thing with the center, same thing with the left center, same thing with the left tackle, and the left guard's going to make his block at the 30. But we want to really harp on those vertical landmarks. So we can, we can give the returner as much clear vision. We want to clear his vision as best as we can so he can make decisions uh, in, a, in a fast way and not get disrupted, uh, disrupted as he's returning. So um, to me, that's the hardest thing, particularly early in the season, is the hardest thing to rep and get guys to understand what path I need to get on in order to make my block. And then on the back end, you know, like we kind of talked about early, earlier in the, the talk, on the back end, depending on what set of rules you're playing under will depend on what you do on the back end. If you can still make a wedge, then like I would tell that fullback, he's going to sit – this, this is a landmark wedge that's drawn up here. 
where he's going to the middle of the field because we're trying to take it to the middle of the field. So he's going to the middle of the field, and, and it's drawn up at the eight. So we're saying this ball's probably going to get kicked into the end zone. We're going to bring it out. Um, or uh, we would tell him, hey, you're going to go set it up in front of the return or wherever he is if it's a more of, a, of an alley return or a sideline return. But I would tell the fullback, you're setting the wedge, and then whoever's going with him, in this case the right end, he's sprinting to get to his hip. And then the guy that, that makes it, the guy that makes the return, in my opinion, is the off returner. The guy that's a smart guy, that's a tough guy, um, guy that can make decisions on the run. He's going to let – he's going to make sure that ball gets caught by the returner. He's not going to let the return run – worry about anything other than securing the ball and running the pattern of the return. And the off returner is going to make the go call, go, go, go. And now the fullback works up the field with the – with whoever's working with him, in this case the right end, to take care of the uh, the R5. The left end is taking care of the L5. And then that off returner, you know, his first – in this, this return, his eyes will go to the L5 first. Um, and then he would uh, then search light for whoever else is unblocked. One thing that we do, and it's not drawn up on here, but I think it's important for the off returner and returner is to always know who we're not blocking. So if you can always, if they can always tell you who we're not blocking, then when they do get a clear path and everybody does their job, then they know where to look for the free guy. And uh, that's when, in my opinion, when your big plays start to happen because those guys know you know, to anticipate where the, the unblocked player is. So I think the landmark, the path of the kick and understanding how to get your leverage, you want to flip, you want to sprint. I'm talking front line now. Front line guys, you want to sprint to your landmark. You want to flip uh, as square as possible. Um, shuffle to your fit. That's a big coaching point. Um, um, I got years ago, and I never thought about it, but if you watch on film, the guys that cross over to try to make their block, they're done. They never make their block. You got to shuffle to your fit and keep a base, good football position. Then you lock on, play physical, and uh, and you want to have that thing secured uh, no more than five yards from wherever your landmark is, and allow that returner to have as as, as much you know clear clear vision as you can give him. Cool. Yes, sir. Got about five minutes, Coach. All right. Well, I can just tell you guys, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to do this. Uh, Coach G, thanks for putting this together. It's, uh, you know, very, uh, very impressive that you got all these guys together. And, uh, again, my email is uh, stu, S-T-U, at cards.com. If, uh, if you want to email me, and, and uh, I'll be glad to chat with you further about anything we can do uh, at Louisville, at the University of Louisville. And, uh, you know, like I said, if you're around this way, you want to come see us. I think that uh, Coach Satterfield, um, you know, I'm very, very fortunate to work for Coach Satterfield. He does an outstanding job. Um, very blessed. Got a great, great staff. I'll tell you that our staff, when we pitch in on special teams, Coach Matlowski is our uh, quality control coach who works on special teams. Uh, we have, I, I, I can't tell you how many guys on the staff that have been special teams coordinators at one point or another. Um, so we get a lot of feedback. We we do it all together, and uh, and I think that's that's really a lot of fun for us to do as a as a group. And um, you know, so I'd encourage you to do that with with your staffs. And, and um, you know, I did want to you know th these are some uncertain times, and I hope everyone's staying safe. Uh, and, and certainly, you know, I know we're all appreciating our our ones that are around us. And, uh, you know, not taking our days for granted. So it's, it's a nice break. Uh, from uh, from everything that's going on, but uh, certainly, guys, you know, stay safe and, and and heed to the to all the guidelines and everything that they're asking us to do. I'll tell you one of the cool things about working for Coach Satterfield um, is is uh, his his wife uh, Beth and then our wives that are on the staff. They always give us uh, some motivation before each week. And I just happened I was I brought some stuff home from my office and. Um, and they little cards every Friday, and it'll be, you know, some type of motivational deal. And this was from, uh, I think, later in the season. We were playing Syracuse. But uh, this card was in my uh, in my uh, locker, as was everybody's on our staff. But um, it's uh, Hebrews 11.1. Now faith, is, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. 
I know that we are in uh, some uncertain times and we're all trying to figure this thing out. You know, so we certainly, uh, you know, we, we, we are, we're in a profession. We're very fortunate that uh, we have a lot of ears that will listen to us um, within our team and our programs. And, uh, and certainly uh, I know that no one takes that for granted and, and we're very fortunate to have that. And I know we're very thankful for that here at Louisville, you know, across the uh, you know, the region or where I know the coaches tell me guys all over the world over here. So yeah. it's uh it's pretty cool. But uh like I said, man, if uh if I can be of any assistance, you got my email address and uh hopefully uh you got a little bit out of that and uh if I can help. Absolutely coach. Thank you so much for your time. Uh a couple guys had, had asked in, in regards to uh you know if you had a PowerPoint or something that you you wouldn't mind sharing should if so could they just email you? Yeah, just tell me, email me. I mean, I, you know, a lot of you notice a lot of stuff I presented today was from other places I've been. But um, you know, like I think I don't know if you some part of the beginning, but um, you know, I, I I'll be glad to, to give you a lot of stuff I've got. Um, but there are some things that you know that we're doing currently that, that I won't share. But but uh, any way that I can help, other than that, I'd be glad to do so. Absolutely. Well, Coach, once again, man, thank you for your time and, and jumping right. on with us to talk some ball, man. Appreciate that. Yeah, appreciate it, guys. Thanks for tuning in.